pass it off to our distinguished moderator. He's uh, an outstanding attorney. He's a senior partner at this firm. He's a dynamic speaker uh, and moderator. So let's hear it for Steve Wurzberg. I don't know if I'm distinguished, but whatever. <laughs> so uh, rather than introduce the panelists, I'm going to let them each introduce them themselves. And uh, what I'm going to ask them to do is to tell us about their organization, their history there, their background, and their involvement or interest in 3D printing. So the first one is Eric Katz, who co-organizes meetup groups and organizes events and con conferences. He's the managing director of, of hardware for Hackers and Founders Co-op. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, so I've been, you know, my history kind of goes back towards, uh, you know, kind of the earlier stages of the maker movement, which, you know, is actually quite intertwined with 3D printing. I mean, when people get excited about that. Um, so I'm just introducing myself in terms of basically been really involved in the early stages of seeing, you know, from tech shop when I was at the first tech shop when there was one tech shop. Um, started a conference called HardwareCon, and uh, now work with startups on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's my passion. So the next panelist is uh, F. Lindenbaum, who's the founder and managing director of Advanced Ventures, which is a venture accelerator and investment fund. Thanks, Steve. So. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually a recovering entrepreneur myself. So I started when I was very young in Silicon Valley. So I'm really excited to see younger people here tonight. Uh, and then in turn grew that first company into a second company, grew that into a very large company and exited in the first dot com boom, which probably some of you were born after at this point. And in turn became a venture capitalist here at Silicon Valley. We've been investing since 1999. So we're one of the few remaining 99 vintage maiden funds that are out there. Those are funds that were started in 99 and are still around today. Uh, we're investing out of our third fund and we invest across three core categories, information technology, communications, and sustainability. Uh, the 3D category falls into an area that we consider part of our communication or connected device dynamic. This is very much what we all hear about, the IoT or Internet of Things. Uh, we're very excited about the vertical applications for supply chain, healthcare, and other elements of the 3D printing space. Uh, you know, if you think about it, when you go to a hospital today, they put a Band-Aid or a bandage on you. Uh, probably in our lifetime, they will actually print you out some skin and you will just be able to put that on like a Band-Aid. So this is going to be a real game changer. Uh, my colleagues on the panel will talk about other areas, so uh, I won't, I won't uh, go too deep there, but a few interesting uh, just stats and in fact live tweeting as we speak, so if you want to check us out at Advanced Ventures on Twitter, uh, one great data point is 3D printing, they estimate, will eliminate 2 million manufacturing jobs in Asia in the next five years. So that's a pretty shocking number if you think about it. Okay. And our third panelist is Espen Silvertson, who's the CEO of Type A Machines of San, San Leandro, which provides 3D printing hardware, software, and services. Yeah, thanks. So um, we, uh, yes, my name is Espen. We build 3D printers and uh, We've been around since 2012. January 2012, we started. Um, Andrew, our CTO and founder, basically had made a little plywood 3D printer. Um, we got asked by a major software company in the Bay Area, which shall remain nameless. Uh, one of their VPs came by and said, "Hmm, what would it cost to, you know, if we were to make 10,000 of these?" And uh, we went away, spent the whole weekend, you know, crunching all the numbers. Came back on the Monday showed them everything, it was like, okay, I was just curious. But by then we had started the company, so <laughs> you know, we were kind of in business. Uh, when we started, there were 14 other 3D printing companies doing what we did in the world. At this point, my latest uh, count had that number at 341. So on average a week right now, there are three new startups in our space. It's a very, very hot space, lots of stuff happening, um, kind of following the hype cycle. We differentiate ourselves in, in three ways. The first is that we don't really care about the hype. We're focused on um, applications for industry. And we do that by providing you with a desktop printer that also works as a massively parallel manufacturing tool. Meaning you can put one on your desktop and make parts, or you can put it in a uh, what we call a pod with six printers, daisy chain those together and make up to a million parts. 
um, which is what one of our customers is on track on uh, doing now. So it's what we call massively scalable manufacturing. And uh, we do that using a very wide variety of plastics. Right now we support 88 different plastics. Our closest competitor is at 30, and by the end of the year, our goal is to be at 200. So we're best in the world in plastics as well right now. I can talk more about our stuff there. Okay. So just to make sure we're all on the same wavelength, um, you might say, what is 3D printing? And to me, it's printing multiple layers which you stack up upon one on, upon another, upon another to create a physical object. It could be a plastic or a metal part, it could be a circuit board, human skin, a human organ, etc. And the 3D printing industry consists of the manufacturers of the printers, the suppliers of the material to print on, for example, custom plastic, the, CA, the CAD software makers, the service providers, and then the people who make and market the ultimate objects themselves. So, um, I guess I have a question for the audience. So how long do people think 3D printing has been around? If you think it's been around for five to 10 years, raise your hand. How about 10 to 20 years? Anybody think it's been that long? 20 to 30 years? More than 30 years. Okay, well, Eric, why don't you tell us about the history of 3D printing? Well, most people don't realize that the original uh, patents for this type of 3D printing, the layered it's called FDM printing, as, is over 30 years old, 30 years plus. It was actually around the same time the dot matrix printers were actually uh, filed. So I, I think that that's hilarious and people don't realize that this technology in, in theory and in, in patent has been around for that long. And really the, the mark of the 3D printing boom really started when 3D printers became accessible, similar to you know, what personal computers did. And the irony is, is that it really was the expiration of the patents that kind of spurred that. And kind of the maker movement uh, created this. So there, was a, there was a group that created this thing called RepRap, open source RepRap. I'm sure Espen knows this much better. Um, but um, that was really what started it. In fact, that was what a lot of technology was based on. And this MakerBot was originally based on all that technology. They took this open source 3D printing technology. So I also find it very ironic that the company that had the patents many, many, many years later after MakerBot has a huge boom rise, had to buy it back for 600 million after they <laughs> let it expire. How long ago was that first MakerBot? What is it? Uh, the first MakerBot? Yeah. Uh, two, I want to say like 2009, something like that. Yeah. So they've been around for a little while. Um, the first MakerBot was like a little, I think it was the cupcake or thing I'm at, a little plywood machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in fact, Andrew, <clears throat> our uh, our founder and CTO who built the first 3D printer for us, he, uh, he started off with one of those and was deeply dissatisfied, which is kind of like his way of being. Uh, and, and you know that you know, he's, he's happy if he's criticizing something and making it better, right? That's, that's the mark of any good engineer. So, uh, so he started taking it apart and trying to make the build volume bigger. And by the end of it, it actually built an entirely new machine. Um, and that's how we, we started. So a lot of, a lot of the RepRap movement, and, and the reason you're seeing so many startups in the space right now is because it's all based on this common platform uh, from, from RepRap. And, uh, uh, particularly Dr. Adrian Boyer out of, I believe, uh, Bath University in, in uh, England started uh, a lot of this. So, you know, it's interesting because the, the real push in the technology has been the reduced cost. What used to be a $60,000 printer is now something that you can buy for a couple of thousand dollars. And so the application of the technology is really the driver, you know, because of the reduced cost, suddenly new, new, new uses are coming out. I was there for like fifty, hundred dollars in kits, right? At the Maker Fair, I think I saw something like that. Yeah, and, and duct tape. Yeah. So, um, thought maybe we'd talk about a concrete use case, and I'd ask Espen to tell us about his airline story. Oh, okay. So um, there are a couple of different things that you can do with three D printing, but. I've told a couple of people about this, this today. One of the things that I find fascinating with the fact that the prices dropped significantly is that you can start doing 
what we call massively parallel production, right? You're using all of these fairly affordable 3D printers to print in parallel to do, do larger parts. So we have one customer um, basically doing parts for aircraft and uh, the issue, I don't know if you guys know this, but about 60% of modern aircraft are plastic or plastic composite parts. So next time you fly, just remember that your aircraft, the, the, the thing you're sitting in, 10,000 feet up in the air, it's glued together, not screwed together. Um, and it's actually safer, <coughs> reportedly. Um, but what it does is, it, 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 you want to have it in plastic because it reduces the weight and you save money and, and fuel when you're reducing weight, and it's also good for the environment. And uh, with these particular parts, we had a customer that was trying to make parts uh, for the inside of the aircraft. Um, and uh, right now, they, they are injection molded. They've been trying to do them on desktop 3D printers, not really succeeding getting beyond the prototyping stage because they couldn't do the massive production. And the cost per part was just too high if you were to do it on an you know, industrial uh, $250,000 device device but what we've been able to do is get them printing on our machines um, particularly the the threaded the screw system is is very difficult to do um, but that technology is available now we're able to do it and just to give you an idea there are about 5,000 of these in every single aircraft and that by reducing the weight by 40 percent that's 1.5 million dollars in fuel savings per aircraft per year it's also a significant reduction in carbon so from an environmental point of view, it's good. From a cost savings point of view, it's good. And I also think it's a significant change in terms of how things are made. Because it's the switch from what we call mainframes, which are all these big, expensive $250,000 3D printers, to servers, which are these desktop 3D printers that you can print in parallel with. And that requires a total different approach. Um, so yeah. Can we uh, hand that out? To yeah, people? we can. We can hand. And I have more. Back you, there you'll as well. see how we'll light see. it is, and uh, kind of it's it's a honeycomb or yeah. type of a. I, I can do it, another quick story as well. So this, these are custom insoles, and our customer, I am custom, is actually in Sam's Club right now with custom foot scanners. So you walk into the store, you get your feet scanned, and then right now they're making custom insoles in the central facility, and then they ship them to you. Uh, but their goal is they've actually spun off a new company which will be doing this with us um, this fall where they'll be printing in store. So it's kind of replacing the one hour photo booth with a, a two hour 3D printing process. You go in, you get your feet scanned, you can choose whether you're a tennis player or a runner or you're going to be in the office all day and then they'll 3D print you perfect uh, insoles and their goal is to be in 3,000 locations um, over the next three years. So with two to six printers in each location, that's between 45 to $90 million in, in manufacturing uh, for us. So it's a, it's a huge industry, and it's just getting started. And what that additive manufacturing lets you do is, you know, what used to be made in a central facility because of the cost per machine is so low now, can actually be done much closer to the end user. And it saves you all kinds of shipping and inventory and security around that. So, uh, oh, go ahead. No, I just kind of adding on that that hype because we, we think we've talked a lot about, you know, people have said the hype and the excitement right. of 3D printing, you know, kind of the, the high levels. Everyone's going to have one in their home, right? Like everyone's going to ubiquitous. It's going to be that. Where do you see that? Do you see that as in the near future or, or do you see that as just kind of one of those ideas that, that kind of got carried away? I, I mean, I think if you look at the market, um, I don't think there's any question that, that people got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of analysts have gotten it wrong as well. And what I think happened was that when, if you look at the sort of, if you guys are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, that's, that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of people have been following. And the peak of the, the hype was probably uh, around the time where MakerBot got acquired. Mm -hmm. um, 2014. You know, 2014, right? Um, and so the reason that people thought this is the home market is because the early adopters were having 3D printers at home. So you have all of these, but if you look at the early adopter crowd, these are tinkerers. These are people who like playing with new technology. They like taking things apart. They like fixing things. They're usually engineers or architects or designers in their day jobs. They have already 3D modeling skills, right? 
And so, so it, it's not the home market. It's not my mum and her microwave oven being able to, you know, hit go and have it print. And and I think it's a fallacy to believe that everyone needs a 3D printer in their home. Um, there will certainly be a lot of 3D printers at home. I think the Mattel thing maker is, is uh, coming, and, and that's a really good example of you know, sort of a niche toy market. It's not going to print for forever. It will maybe do you know, a couple of hundred prints and then break, but it doesn't have to do it anymore. It's a toy. Um, but but it, it's, it's not a 3D printer in every home. It's a tool that you have to learn how to use. And I think actually what we're seeing and what we're part of now is the going out to the trough of disillusionment, which is kind of like that you know, post-hype hangover, which everyone is feeling right now, and into real application, and well, it's industry, right? Yeah, yeah. and it, it, I mean, it's a classic Silicon Valley story, right? Silicon Valley's model is sort of brave new world, and then better, faster, cheaper, right? right. So if you think about all kinds of new technologies when it came out, it, it was in that brave new world category. And, you know, we, in classic Silicon Valley fashion, we put these things out, and then we look to the market to define how they're going to get used. And in the case of open source, which has really changed the dynamic on everything from servers to 3D printing, et cetera, they kind of put that out there, which lowered the floor, if you will, of the lowest common denominator of costs around these, and then the use cases come up. And then that provided a baseline to be able to allow people to come up with interesting supply chain or aeronautics or someone here was, was printing metal. And, you know, I think one of the interesting statistics is when these first came out, these were almost exclusively for prototyping. To Eric's point, these were $100,000 machines that they used to make custom parts. So I've got some interesting stats. So it went from almost exclusively prototyping to now prototyping is only 24% of the uh, 3D printing market, for example. Now it's moved to 16% in product development and now moving into innovation at 11%. So what you're starting to see is this shift from kind of that brave new world, let's figure out what we're going to do with it, to actual business. And as I was mentioning before, when you start thinking about whether it's Sam's Club on Demand or you think about the manufacturing economy, let's say in China, China, this is a game changer because speed, supply chain is everything. So if you think about things like big data, which are able to then process when you as a consumer buy something on Amazon, how quickly that can be manufactured. Today, right, they make a bunch of things, they ship it here, keep it in a warehouse, and then ship it to you. That's like hugely inefficient and very expensive, right? And if you think about what happened with software, right, today you all have SaaS. I mean, how many of you have even a drive in your computer today? CDs? The floppy disk, remember a floppy disk, right? So no one has those anymore, right? So everything's in the cloud. So think about it if you can take your sneakers and do them in the cloud. So you're not going to go to Amazon and buy them. You're not going to go to the store and buy them. They're going to be what we call bespoke, custom made for you. So that's like a real shift from that brave new world to better, faster, cheaper. And, and a comment on that, you know, I, I love to talk about the use case, right? We talk about the hype cycle, but one of the things that I found really funny during that time period, in that 2014, you talk to people, oh, 3D printing. The first thing that came up, and, and it's kind of interesting to look back at it yeah. now, was, oh, you can 3D print a gun. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. Like, that was the thing. And, and, and the mainstream of America, America right? was having That's this America. dialogue uh. about, oh, 3D printing. Oh, it's gone. It's bad. It's like that fear component in that. And, and I always thought it was so funny because I said, you know what, <laughs> even if you can, which at that time that was a questionable point, you, right. know, how, you know, how workable is that, that met, you know, plastic gun, but at the same time, uh, it was like, that's not the big deal, right? The big right. deal is how it's a tectonic shift in our supply chain and our manufacturing and, and everything. I mean, it's going to completely change the world around us as we know. I said, that's the thing to get excited about. But it was amazing how when you, you heard 3D printing, it was like synonymous with gun and or, or, or 3D printing gun. And the funny thing is you don't hear about it. It was, it was like one nut that was obsessed with 3, 3D printing a gun and you know he was able to fire it a couple times, and and you know like it's, it's right. Funny. Well, but we've now turned the corner because if and check us out on Twitter with this, there is a 3D candy printer, and there's a really famous candy store called Dylan's, which is actually Ralph Lauren's daughter Dylan's store, and she started in New York, and they have just come up with a 3D printer from a, a company in Britain that will now print your custom candy for you. So when you actually get to the point where this generation of young kids that will go to that candy store. 
will have whatever flavor they want in whatever shape they want printed. 20 years from now, the concept as we knew it of candy has just changed, which is a way cooler story than guns because yeah. it's just more yeah. fun. It's but, candy. But, yeah. but I think what it speaks to is, is this trend towards mass customization. Exactly. Right? And that's really what we're, we're, what we're seeing. And for that to become available to the consumer, you actually need industry to adopt it first. So I kind of think of it as three waves. You know, The first wave was the prototyping gang. That's been going on for the last 30 years or more. The second wave now is going to be industry adopting it. You're not necessarily going to see a 3D printer in every home, but you might have a 3D printer in the store, and you're definitely going to see them you know, in, in, in the behind the scenes sort of supply chain settings. And then down the line, you're going to start seeing 3D printers appear in the home, but more likely it's going to be local distribution. You know? Well, and, and, but yeah. it, and I'll challenge a little bit because I think the sure. places where you're going to see 3D printing homes, because you guys come from the maker movement, which is plastics and toys and guns and all these things. What, what people aren't thinking about is where they're going to appear first is actually in your refrigerator. Because food printing, 3D food printing, is actually going to be one of the fastest adoptive. We've already started to see restaurants come out on this. Uh, we're already starting to see the major manu appliance manufacturers like Samsung and LG start looking at how they can actually build these into your refrigerators. So if you think about it today, you know, you've got little coffee pods. Think about it's very simple for them to, in essence, ship you out three or four or five different flavors with protein and other elements, and you can just go ahead and print. So think about how many things you buy at the store that are really kind of fully processed oriented things like cheeses and things like that. You can literally then do that. And that changes this whole dynamic because it goes from sort of that prototype kind of let's make cool plastic de Dungeons and Dragon figures to, all right, I'm going to make an ice cream for my kid on the fly. And that's a game changer. And that whole generation is going to have that customized sort of bespoke reality, right? I, that's actually, not I actually think food's going to be a, a later adoption. Uh, part of it is, is, yeah, I'll tell you why. There are a couple of things with it. Mm. Um, the first thing is the FDA requirements. And, and if you look at it, 3D printing has the sugar 3D printer mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years now. Still not FDA compliant. Well, so what's interesting um, is, when the yeah. is when the appliance guys get involved, mm -hmm. it actually changes it. So the question really becomes, is it a f where it fits in the food model? And right. so what they're doing is they're changing the dynamic from actually a creation device to basically like a coffee maker, if you yeah. think about it. And once they kind of hurdle that uh -huh. equation, then they're over the FDA model. So what you know, and that's where if you think about it, there are things kind of 3D-esque printing that's going on all the time, and specifically in food. If anybody's had a soft serve ice cream cone, that's kind of 3D printing at a very baseline level. And they're riding that story into the home. And all you need is a new refrigerator with a cool 3D printer feature in there, and you're off and running. I mean, I think that the threshold for me is going to be, is it easier than just ordering something online? Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so if you look at the, the reason I don't think a 3D printer in every home is necessarily going to happen just sure. yet is because I have my cell phone. And if I that's want true. something, I can just order it. And that's getting easier and easier and easier to do. And we have drone delivery and all kinds of different. And my favorite startup at the moment is Taco Copter, right? Yeah. Like, order a taco. Um, and and <coughs> the ability to distribute things really, really quickly is kind of the key. Sure. And cost effectively and at, at no so, so I think it's exciting, and I'll be the first person to have a you know three D printer in my fridge. Trust me, you don't want to see my fridge. Um, but I think knowing what I know about fused filament printers and actually how hard it can be to get them to be reliable and, and easy to maintain and all those things, I think local distribution centers where you have sure. those things and then quick delivery is probably more likely. I, I see a replacement of the Amazon warehouse before I see a 3D printer in every home. Yeah, yeah well, and, and I think you have to think about, you know, to what scale and what style of 3D printer it's going to yeah. be. I mean, you know, these things, you know, it's going to be some sort of hybridized 3D printing model where, where in food in particular, if you think about it, appliance manufacturers sold a whole lot of toasters that will actually put a little smiley face on your toaster. Okay, right. so if they sold... Uh, there you go. If, the, if they could sell millions of toasters oh, yeah. that will put your, now they've got toasters that will put your picture on there. So if you think about that's the baseline, you know, you will get these enthusiasts, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, they're moving $500 sous vide units like crazy, so. Yeah. And I mean, there's already the pancake bot, right? Yes, we and, well, you. and that's cool. I mean, has yeah. anybody seen it? Check us out. Uh, so I think we tweeted that earlier today. Pancake bot will draw you 
in pancake out of a 3D printer because you want that. And then you can eat yourself, which is just kind of cool. Yeah. So maybe it's worth fantasizing a little bit about some of the... Uh, I thought we were doing that with the eating yourself with yeah, the 3D yeah. printer part, but... But I, I was going to go beyond food. I mean, uh, um, you know, am I, am I going to uh, soon have a... Uh, disc in my back that's made in 3D printing. Well, I was going to bring up the 3D printing ear and, parts, but yeah, yeah it's, yeah. it's not nearly as fun as the candy and the pancakes. How about fashion? Am I going to have dresses that are designed yeah. and made? I kind of like to hear each of you talk a little bit about some of the applications you see for 3D printing. Uh, so, so, I mean, you know, I, I can maybe give more of a, a foundational instead of just the applications. I think some of the implications of 3D printing are really fascinating and exciting. Um, because if you think about it from a fundamental technology perspective, how we manufacture, I mean, we had the Industrial Revolution and mass manufacturing, and mass manufacturing brought down the cost exponentially of producing a product, but, you know, the downside, you had to produce a ton of it, and, and, and we've, we've perfected that, right? Now, the, irony, the interesting thing about 3D printing is it changes the economics, where, mm -hmm. you know, it used to be you have to produce, you know, a plastic part, and one is $10,000, or 10000 is a dollar a piece, okay. but that's the price. And now, that's where, you know, Espen was talking about mass, menu, mass customization. That's why mass customization has not really been possible. Bespoke has been expensive. So I think a couple of really interesting implications. One is I think we can actually have a much more sustainable, better use. We're not going to waste as much because when you, you do mass manufacturing, you, you, you put out a product out there in, in the tens of thousands, and if it doesn't go, it ends up in the cheap junk bin or the recycle bin or something. And I think if people have this, I print on demand. So think about it from the, the print perspective. When you had to go actually, and this is like way back, predates my time a little bit, but go print a resume, right? You had to go to a printer. You would have to go print like several hundred copies because you wouldn't want to run out because it'd be expensive. So, you know, you, you'd then give as many and then whatever's left over, if you got the job, then you throw them away, right? So I think that's the paradigm we're in with the products. Now, when you go out to go print a resume, you don't print 200 of them, you print just what you need. And so I think that's an implication <coughs> that is really gonna change how we do material usage, where we buy it. I, I agree with you, I think that they, the local store is gonna be at, you know, more of that, that delivery in the local. The, the other interesting point is also to, when you calculate shipping costs from worldwide, right now we have mostly a lot of overseas, right? And the fuel cost to get it over here is a huge percentage of all these products. So even though the labor is really cheap and the parts are really cheap, the reality is when you add on the import and all the cost of actually getting it halfway around the world, those costs aren't going down, they're going up, you know? And, and I know fuel's cheaper now, but that's just a huge thing. So I think those are the big implications. Well, and I think that that's where, you know, we can look at a resurgence in American manufacturing right. or even regional manufacturing. So if you look at it, if you just kind of sort of broaden out the circle around the U.S., you've got places in Latin America that have, tr you know, just completely decimated economies. And, you know, the challenge is, is is making the kind of infrastructure investments that are required to do injection molding and build factories are very challenging. But if you've got labor and intelligent labor that you're able to put in place, that's a much shorter flight from a U.S. territory Absolutely. or Mexico or even into northern Latin America to the U.S. than it is to put it on a boat for China. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, go ahead. Please. I, I, just to speak to that a little bit, I, I think it's really interesting. Um, hey, Lucian, can you go grab the metal impeller piece that's on, on the, yeah, yeah, there's like a little metal, it looks like an a, a impeller pump. I'll just use that as an example. That's the one, yeah, thanks. So um, there's a really interesting thing happening, right, which is, Eric was kind of touching on this as well, when local production trumps centralized production, everything changes. And so I actually did this as an example. This is a 3D printed part that was then cast. And the reason we cast it is because it's much cheaper than 3D printing in metal, which is a million dollar or more machine, right? So just to give you an idea of the cost of producing this part, if I were to make it in a traditional subtractive manner using a milling machine, cutting it out of a block, I would need an 11 axis mill and uh, we costed it out with a, a company, and, and the price they gave us was between $1,800 and $2,000 for, for one part. Wow. We priced the same with a metal 3D printer, and we actually got exactly the same cost, $1,800 to $2,000. Now, with a metal 3D printer, you can do more fancy stuff like, uh, you know, hollow internal geometries and so on, but you don't really need that for most pumping systems. 
we made this for 60 bucks. We printed it for about six dollars, and then we cost it for time materials and so on. It was about sixty bucks, and so I was curious, and I was curious what it would cost to ship this part from New York to Rotterdam, which is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. And uh, the answer is, it would take twelve days and cost about one hundred and fifty dollars to ship one thing because you have to do all the paperwork. If you're shipping a whole container load, it's about you know fifty cents. Now, but it's still 12 days. So, okay, well, what's the alternative? Well, I can overnight it using FedEx. And that's actually about 175 bucks. It's not that much more expensive, but it still takes 24 hours. We can make this part for $60 in less than 24 hours. What's the future of shipping and logistics? Yeah. Right? It's local production. And that's good news for every single country in the world. I, I really strongly believe this. So, we, yeah. Yeah. So, so just to finish up, we did a study um, about a, a year and a half ago, looking at our, our maker segment, the, the makers in our customer base, and one in ten of our makers had created their own business or running their own small company using our 3D printers as their primary production tool. So just to put that in context, one in ten, just by buying our product, that's a better statistic than graduates graduating business school and then going on to starting companies. So by just selling 3D printers and making them available, and I don't know whether this is more about business schools than uh, 3D printing, but it's a really, really interesting statistic. Yeah. yeah. I so. mean, just, just, to, just to touch on that about where they did, about the country, it's interesting. Yeah. I, so I went in, in China, I spoke in December, and I think there's a realization of this, yeah. this change there, right? So um, in, in China, in Shenzhen, one of the manufacturing capitals, where there's an all-out uh, obsession and, and race to build an entrepreneurial class and group in, in, in China. And I mean, they're obsessed with Maker. They love this because they, they, they're really, really getting behind that. They want to build it. And I think they just they see the writing on the wall with they can't they can no longer just rely on being the world's manufacturing base because of these transformative forces. So their answer is to create their own entrepreneurs and, and all that, sure. so it's really interesting. Well, and, and if you think about it, when you've got a, tr a, a transition from an industrial to an information society, if you think about it, people were milling those out, then they were running machines that mill them out, then they were sitting behind a computer as an assembly line spins them out, but your point, they're still very expensive. Now it's gonna be the person behind a computer with a, with a printer there that can then spin it out in five unit quantity and move it around. And so as we move into this kind of bespoke or customized world, everybody wants their own custom thing, this makes it a lot easier. And then when you look at places like China, it's gonna change the trajectory. And we were just debating whether right. injection molding will ever go away or not. And uh, it's a debate. Uh -huh. So let me ask a couple mm -hmm. questions of you guys. The first one is I see a paradox. I mean, I read that 3D printing is supposed to grow from um, 4 billion to 18.4 billion from 2015 to 2020. And that would be about a third of the overall printing industry growth. On the other hand, number one and two 3D printing companies in terms of revenues, Stratasys and 3D Systems, we had a 29 and 14 percent market share, respectively, are both in the midst of management changes. They saw their unit sales fall 32 percent and 66 percent in the first quarter 2016. And just on Monday, Piper Jaffrey downgraded both of their stocks after channel checks revealed a further significant slowdown in the second quarter. So I kind of like to understand, is, is 3D printing really here and going to do all the great things we're talking about? Is this, is this just a a blip, or is this is this uh, a bellwether of what's going to happen to other other companies in the industry? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm not a, a Wall Street guy. I'm a technologist, so I see the, the potential for the long term, and, and fully believe it, and see where it's really going to shape the, the future and, and, and everything. Um, but I think those statistics are, are a result, and these companies are, are decades. I mean, they're 30 years old, they're 20 year old, they're public companies. I think, you know, because of the companies like Espens that are changing the, the game, that are changing the, the costs that the companies, there's new technology, new companies, and even here that are really doing that, that, those big companies with those bloated, expensive, really expensive printers, you know, they're half a million dollars and a, a lot of those, and I, I think that's changing. So, you know, one, I think the market for very expensive printers, which is limited to corporate, large corporate and research government, and, and again, I think that market might be saturated. But 
really this is marking this is the, the broadening of this kind of whole new market, which is you know access for everybody. Because how many people do I even know that had access to a half a million dollar printer? And I know a lot of people who would, but it's it's really hard, right? It's just like the mainframe. Yeah. And, so. I mean, it's a classic sort of boom and bust cycle. When, when there's a new technology that has a lot of promise in Silicon Valley, there's a rush of venture capital into that market. That grows. Then there needs to be kind of exit and consolidation. That's the two, the two stocks in particular that Steve was speaking about happen to be sort of the two bellwether 3D printing stocks that are out there in the public markets. Now, what is interesting, and I think I think there's a tweet on this tomorrow from us, is the first 3D printing ETF has come out. So if anybody knows what an ETF is, mm -hmm. they take a, essentially stock from many different companies, bundle it into a category, and then you can buy into 3D printing. So that was that just happened, actually. In fact, it was out on Yahoo Finance today. Wow. So, I mean, you know, it's transitioning, like I was saying, from Brave New World, where they were big machines, and they were super expensive, and they were used for prototypes for aerospace. And then everybody said, oh my God, everybody's going to print their toys at home. It's going to be the greatest things, and they'll never have to buy a button again because I lose one, I'll print one. And everybody was like, yeah, it didn't work out so well, right? But now we're moving into the phase where people like Espen have found the right way to use your product in an industrial setting, what we call IIoT or Industrial Internet of Things. But then also in areas like Steve was mentioning, where we've got huge innovation happening, like in biotechnology, where they're literally printing human organs and things and you know and elements like that. That is just going to blow the doors off what we think. But it took Espen, it took all those other companies to develop the technology so that that aspect was a settled science. So the biologists could come and figure out how to make the cells work with that story, right? So you have to have a foundation somewhere to make those things work. If there wasn't open source, they would be spending all their time trying to build a printer instead of trying to figure out how to build an ear. And so now they're trying to figure out how to build ears. And that's super, super interesting. Because if you think about it, you know, just generally in the healthcare space, you know, so much, whether it's skin or organs or anything else, we wear out. We're humans, right? So think about the ability to start replacing our parts, like your car. I mean, if you got a car and it just wore down and it died, and that's how cars worked, people would not buy cars, right? We would have moved on from that. But that's kind of how we are as humans, right? You're born and you're basically in this long decline until the end. Well, think about if we started getting spare parts for ourselves. I mean, we've been borrowing them from other humans for a while. We figured that out. Now imagine if, I don't think we're doing it at home anytime soon, but if you went to Stanford and someone needed a new kidney and they took your T cells and your gene profile and they printed you a new kidney. I mean, woohoo. I don't, mean, don't, don't, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't not stop drinking anytime soon. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. But, but, uh, that's a liver, that's man. Liver. Yeah. It's a liver, but you know, hey, what's in Oregon, right? Uh, but they're, they're, they're actually, because there are really two companies in the world working. Oh, we're getting feedback. Let's turn one on. There you go. Um, I, mean, like on the, I don't know too much about the, uh, the, the printing of, of cells because it's not, not our field, but there, there are about you know, two main companies in the world doing this, and one's doing a liver and the other is doing a kidney. And they're probably actually do, um, so, uh, uh, someone was telling me the other day they'll probably do a cat liver first mm -hmm. because okay. it's a much more simpler mm -hmm. structure. Sure. Uh, so we'll probably, and the other nice thing about people, People are very willing to pay for operations for the pets. You know, it's part of your family. <laughs> companion animal. And companion Good animal. Space. And so you're more likely to see replacement parts for your pets before you see them for, for yourself. I'll debate yeah. that. I'll debate that. I mean, because this is going to be like that $500,000 kidney you're buying at this point. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm not sure that, you know, Spot gets the kidney right. quite yet. You know <laughs> what I mean? But but I but It's going to be easier to put it in Spot than it is in... Easier? In, I'm not debating yeah. that. But, I, but you know, it's... What would you... You know, would you sell your big Silicon Valley house to get yourself another 20 years? I think most people would probably, you know, make that bet. But what's interesting is it's not just the printing part. In order for some of these things to come together, you need the convergence of a lot of things. You need the convergence of cell dynamics, genomics, big data, so you can process it really quick to figure out what, why my kidney is different than your kidney. I mean, we're not like printing out like generic kidneys here. You need to print your kidney. So you need the big data, you need the AI, you need all of these other pieces. You probably even need some virtual reality in there because then you're going to have to look at that kidney and match it against yours and make sure that it's consistent before you kind of start cutting into someone and go, 
know, oops, we got the yeah. pipes wrong, right? So, I mean, I think that there's a lot that has to come together, but that changes it. You know, right now we're thinking aircraft and we're thinking plastic parts and we're thinking maybe waffles, right? And we're thinking food and candy and, you know, maybe guns. But, you know, the real, you know, change is going to be when you can move into human health, when you can move into some of these really advanced areas. Right. I mean, it's just a game changer. Imagine people who have been smoking for 50 years, it's print you new lung. Yeah. I mean, yeah. probably, you know, stop smoking still because it's not going to happen soon. But. Yeah, and let, let me add, because um, we... Uh, the very beginning, you talked about the million or more jobs that will be lost because of this. But I think there's going to be a lot of jobs gained sure. because of 3D printing as it moves into these applications. I mean, I, I, I just think some of the applications are just beyond our imagination, you know. To, Absolutely. And, and, and I'm not saying it will be tomorrow, but, I, yeah. you know. We, we've talked a lot about that. So, I mean, I'm a manufacturer of machines that make plastic parts, right? Um, I was also raised properly, so I care about the world, I care about people. Um, and we have a lot of conversations about what the impact of what we're doing is going to have on the world. And are we going to, if you look at the 2D printing industry, um, when you know, the sort of first desktop printers came out, um, and so like the, the first uh, IBM mainframes started coming out even before then, people were like, okay, this is the dawn of the paperless office, right? And then you get desktop printing, and lo and behold, paper consumption shoots up through the roof. And it's only in 2001 that it even starts evening out in the US and the rest of the world is still catching up. And so, so there are more you know, wasted trees today than any time before in human history. And we risk a lot of going plastic's going to die. You're right. telling me a lot of plastic's going to die. Let's just say there, there are a lot of dinosaurs that should be very, very afraid right now. <laughs> and so, you know, elements like material recycling, local production, oh, that's uh, job creation on the local level is something that I think is a possibility. Sure. Well, one of but, the it, but, but it, it's a possibility right now, and well, it, it really depends on how we invest Well, so right? that's the dream yeah. of Hollywood's 3D printing model, which is instead of actually selling you Star Wars figures or, you know, American Doll or Barbies, what will actually happen, because those don't live very long. Kids get really excited, and six months later, you know, unless we're geeks and put them in our closets, they're gone. You know, they blow through them. The concept here is could you actually have this in a situation where you're going to print out because Hollywood's going to let, is going to essentially license you the American girl or the Star Wars character. You print it out at home, the kid plays with it, and once it reaches a certain stage of non interest, they're going to recycle that plastic and you're going to print the next cool thing. Now, Hollywood, if you think about it, that's the software story. That's what we on the venture world have created, right? The ability to actually never ship you anything. Anything, right? When's the last time you got a package from a software company? We don't. We're doing it all online. So that's like shaving margin like you would never believe. For us, like if we're looking at a software company and has less than a 70% margin, they're doing something hugely wrong. You know, and the, you know, the margins are incredibly high because they've eliminated boxes and disks and shipping and everything else. Now it's all just marketing. So if you think about Hollywood and how they can change it, now they're just going to license you a character which you're going to download. Print it on the plastic. Kid plays for for a little while. And to your point about the sustainability and the, the future of the Earth concept, can then they recycle it? And that's the interesting piece that we're waiting to see. Well, yeah. Because like you know, having an acid bath to drop it is just not really cool for the home market, well, I, right? I think that's actually getting addressed. What's interesting? I mean, we live in a time and era where sustainability is kind of at the forefront of people's minds. So I was, you know, a couple of years ago, I saw an event that was talking about that material science, and in fact, more and more. We're seeing that because there are certain plastics that are better or worse. And I think that what's interesting about this movement versus in the past is that these new products, these new technologies are going to be designed, you know, cradle to grave as they talk about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, there's a, a lot of kind of plastics that, that, that are plant-based plastics mm -hmm. that can dissolve and, and all that. Um, so I think it's really interesting, you know, and we talk about, you know, displacement of people and what's going on. But I, I think if we take a step back and look at the 3D printing technology as what it is. It's a tool, right? It's, and what's really transformative about it is it's a tool of the next industrial revolution. Sure. We think of the first one, it was a mill or a lathe. And, and so 
back in the day, people said, oh my God, that's you know, a machine, you can make a machine out of it. And right. now it's the same thing. And eventually it's going to become like wallpaper. Well, they said <laughs> this was going to put operators out of business right. and telcos out of business and everything else. I don't know if anybody's seen the last T-Mobile ad. Those guys are still alive. Right. Okay? They're yeah. kicking yeah. and they're free whatever this but, week. You but, know? but I think you, you, you kind of touched on it earlier as well. It's like what we're seeing with, and it's not just 3D printing, by the way. It's laser cutting. Mm -hmm. It's milling. It's desktop fabrication. It, it's it's because of the, the the development in electronics and, and machinery and the, the reduced price, it's possible to do these sort of like, you know, uh, lower cost machines that can build high quality parts. Mm -hmm. What it enables us to do, which I think you uh, encompass really nicely, is the digitization of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. That's really what it comes down to. And you've got IoT. You've got you know, Pokemon Go and AR and all of these different uh, elements that are coming together to create a seamless interface between the digital and the physical. And if you think about it, you know, our smartphones let us go from the physical into the digital realm really easily right now. But there isn't really a tool that lets us go the other way. And that's where digital fabrication really comes in. And so in terms of like, you know, global trends, what I, I think is that the big game changer is is being able to take digital files and turn them into physical stuff affordably, cost effectively, and timely and conveniently locally. And that opens up you know a whole new job market that just didn't exist before. But it's not really hardware; it's services. Yeah. Right. And it's just to add to that, yeah. you say the digitization of stuff, right? There's one other word I'd like to also add to talking about desktop fabrication is the democratization of public oh, of, of that's production. A thing, yeah. That's a huge thing. And so, like you said, you're creating jobs by selling people printers. This is the democratization of production. Yeah. And so, whereas you have to you used to have a huge factory and very expensive capital equipment, which was just out of the reach of even most small businesses. And then now, in this day and age, just like you know, to to open up a, a software company, the law, the costs are very low. So we're seeing that that's going to be a major transformative force is on the, in the fabrication of these cost reductions. All right, I'd like to switch gears for a second to something that might be near and dear to some of these people people's hearts. And that's talk about investment in this space. So um, I saw that Carbon 3D raised $100 million in Series C funding in the second half of 2015 in a, uh, a round led by Google Ventures. So I'm wondering, what, what was the venture capital appetite in 2015 and so far in 2016? Do you expect it to increase? And who are some of the, the key players in the investment space where someone who had a 3D printing idea could, could go to seek investment. Well, so so I think that, they, that we've sort of, you know, are, are in that transition phase between brave new world, what are we going to do with it, and we're on the investor side really waiting to see. And what you're seeing with that transaction is the industrial side. You know, Google's a huge player in robotics. It's a huge player in manufacturing. And they see this in, in a lot of ways like Espen does in, in regard to the fabrication. And they also bought and then just divested a, a robotic arm company and other elements like that. But when you talk about the China concept, and that's where a lot of investment in 3D printing and robotics and other elements are happening, which is outside of the US. Uh, there's a lot happening in Europe. There's a lot happening in Asia. And, and that's because those economies still have people that are producing extremely high quality parts like that for Porsche and Ferrari and people like that, as well as Miele and a lot of other really high-end appliances in places like Europe. In China, it's a volume game and it's a customization game and it's how fast can they get a prototype because what we're doing here in, in Silicon Valley is we're sending them an electronic 3D file of the next phone. And what we're expecting is a FedEx to arrive the next day with a prototype from China. And they're struggling under that burden. I mean, you've got, you know, they're throwing, you know, just bulk at the problem. Now they're going to be able to high speed that story. So what we're doing is where before there was a lot of just raw, as we'd say, shotgun investing, a lot of money across a broad space. We're now seeing it really move in and specific VCs. So, you know, there's a great accelerator called Bolt. Uh, you know, Eric can talk about some other groups. There's Highway One and there's like a ton of incubators that are working on, I think Espen's working on his own incubator, right? Maybe you speak to that, sure. for 3D printing startups. So, you know, we're kind of getting over that first hype cycle, as Eric said. We're now kind of in the bit of the doldrums. We're kind of saying, who's got a real business? 
You know, it's not just, hey, gee whiz printer, everybody's going to buy one, we'll all get rich. This is like, who's going to make something cool? And it's moved to the point where on the venture side, we call it, kind of call it, look at like the gold rush, right? We're now, want, we want to invest in picks and shovel companies and not in miners anymore. So we want to invest in Esmond, who's really going to be a B2B, you know, business for major manufacturers or candy machines that are going to get sold to candy companies or food machines that are going to go, you know, technology of a food machine that, that then Samsung's going to buy or license or buy to go inside their refrigerators. There'll be a tweet about that tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, man. Uh, so do you, do you yeah. just see then that um, instead of larger investments in a few companies, you're going to be seeing smaller investments in a large number of companies and there'd be more in the application space rather than I, mean, I, I can speak a little bit from what I'm seeing on, on my side of the, the I mean, thank you for that, that's yeah, really sure. interesting. Uh, you know, there are, so, so if you think about 3D printing, like it's a tool and it has so many different applications that there are really quite a lot of very big companies that are looking to get into the space. HP just got in, right, with, with their printer. Mm -hmm. um, they're a steamroller compared, like if you look at 3D systems and struts, they're, they're a very, very tiny part of, you know, in terms of market cap compared to, to, to HP. Um, and there are other companies as well looking but there, there's a huge shakeup, and there's so much noise. You know, the industry uh, analysts don't even know what's going on. You've got Terry Wallers, who makes the Wallers Report, which is kind of like the right, yeah. standard thing, um, uh, on stage in Orlando, basically saying, "I have no idea how many 3D printing companies there are in the world right now." Right? He just he doesn't know. He's got some numbers, uh, and interestingly enough, he knows exactly how many. 3D printer shipped last year, even though he doesn't know how many units. Like, yeah, that's weird. I was, those analysts always yeah, kind of, always skeptical. But of he knows thing. his stuff and he knows the industry. But it's it it it's very low visibility, and so there are a lot of big companies, both on the manufacturing side and and on the sort of consumer side, looking at what 3D printing is going to be um, a good for in their space, and they will they will make the acquisition that makes sense for them. So I think there are going to be some big acquisitions, and you probably see a lot of smaller mergers and a lot of deaths, particularly in the fused filament space. And 341 companies, not all of them are going to be around. And in fact, a lot of them are dying off right now. Um, we've been less about the hype and more focused on just slow, steady tech development. We haven't even gotten into our growth phase, and we've been growing 30 to 40 percent year over year since we started. We turned profitable in, in January, so I'm super happy about that. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. But, but it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, the investors are, are, are going in if they see the direct application, but it's application, not technology, that's going to be the driver here. Yeah. I really believe that. And, and do you think those application companies are going to have a smaller need for capital, given what they're doing? So that's a good question. So, He's going to say no, and I'm going to say yes, and then well, we're probably going to meet I, I somewhere think, in the middle. Well, I think the application companies are not how we think about it because the the, the you know the the core of a lot of this is 3D CAD design and elements like that, and that that's that's already fully consolidated market, and so really Autodesk lives at the top of that food chain, and then there are a few nibblers or some niche players around you know really unique sets or very verticalized markets, but that's the foundation. It's just like the open source side of the inherent sort of foundation of the printing side right now, that those have become almost like settled matters to a degree, I think. And now, you know, it's, it's kind of op, niche, op, niche operations that are, that are going to come out of it. But those could be very valuable, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. you know, uh, they say, for example, um, you know, when you talk about fashion, everybody thinks clothing. But actually, jewelry and costume jewelry is one of the most, you know, uh, kind of interesting areas because being able to print costume jewelry to go with your outfit but actually be able to print real jewelry is quite, you know, you're not going to be printing diamonds anytime soon, but silvers and golds and, and those are soft yeah. metals. In fact, that's it's been a huge business. That was one of the first really totally. commercially adopted Shapeways. And there's a yeah. lot of jewelry designers that just use Shapeways and totally. made that business. And actually, when you think about it, you got a pendant or something, that's $60, $80, a nice metal, that, in a design that you could not fabricate any other way. Totally. It, it, it is, it's staggering. Um, what is Shapeways? So Shapeways is an online service company that will take your digital file and then print it and, and send you the physical object. Yeah. And there are a couple of those around. Um, you, you know, just to bring it back to, to sort of the, the, 
what I'm seeing, so what we've got over in San Leandro, five minutes south of Oakland Airport, is an old Chrysler Plymouth Dodge plant. It's an old car plant. And we have nine acres of space that we're gradually turning into a tech cluster. Uh, we have 11 3D technology startups uh, doing digital fabrication in one form or other. None of them are competing directly with each other. And we're sort of incubating and working together to, to make these marketable um, uh, companies. And so the counterpoint to needing a lot of money to get into this is, uh, and I think you actually touched on it really nicely, is there are the, these niches that you can grow out of. And they're very profitable. And the nice thing about desktop fabrication as a, as a, as a trend is that you know, a $4,000 3D printer gives me access to the tools I need in order to start a company. And, and then as my market increases in demand, I can just buy more and more machines. And that's kind of where we bridge the gap between you know, single part production and volumetric million part production. Because at no point do you have to make that you know, 500,000 or a million dollar investment in capital equipment. You can simply scale organically as demand <coughs> increases. And that actually changes the sort of investment um, landscape a little bit, I think, particularly for these smaller startups when you don't need that kind of level of money. Now, I still think that you get to a certain level where you want to go global, you want to you know, invest in your sales team. You need, uh, you know, one of the things we do is hardware scaled by software, we call it, which is really you know, multiple machines working in parallel but controlled by software. At that point, you need more resources in order to, to really to capture market share. So you know, these guys aren't going to be out of a job anytime soon. I think it's very, very safe to say. Uh, and, and we need them to be able to grow so but, lucky. Uh, I'm but super worried. You, you, uh, yeah. you have the best job in the world, right? Like you get to, to see the landscape. Really? I, I was feel up like, like all night last night reading docs, man. So I don't there know how go. good a job it is that uh, everybody uh, else went to sleep last night. Uh, right. and, but, but from my side, I feel like what we're seeing is kind of the grassroots perspective of that. And, and both are very doable. And you're seeing more and more hardware companies that are really coming into their own because they're not really hardware companies anymore. That's the second time Rob's uh, that sign. Yeah, yeah Rob's right. Rob, Rob, yeah. It is Q and A time. It be. is Q and A time. Yeah. So the first of all, let's hear it for our panel. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get in as many questions from the audience as possible. Uh, we'd like you to use the mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand high. If you want us to come by with the mic, stand up. State your great question, speak in the mic, and uh, it's going to go a long way towards us having quality video that we can all use as a learning resource forever. Uh, Gloria has a question. Gloria, stand up. I was thinking about all the attorneys in the United States today who are earning a living enforcing and establishing copyright laws. And I'm wondering how 3D printing is going to intersect with this uh, legal matter. They seem to be apparently somewhat opposite. Where are we headed with these two movements? Well, I mean, I mean go ahead. Do you want to get, I'll, I'll answer too. Go yeah, ahead. so just, just a quick thing. I mean, I, I think this has always been a hotly debated topic. When, when, when internet file sharing first came about and the thought of the death of the music industry, when we moved away from CDs into the MP3s, people thought, oh my God, no one's ever going to pay for music, right? It's the same thing. But really, the debate has been you know, you talk to people and, and, and they're I'm willing, they're like, I'm willing to pay, I just need something easy. Right. And the moment you create a service that's easier to just, you know, pay a monthly fee or something, then go download it, then people are gonna do that. They go through path, path of least resistance. So, you know, there's two approaches, and I think the music industry did it right and did it wrong. Like Steve Jobs helped usher in digital music. And in fact, he personally, like, probably helped kind of stifle the, the, a lot of the, the downloading, and it was the industry that was taking a protectionist approach that, that almost hurt it. So they said, no, no, we're not, we don't want digital, digital's bad, and you gotta buy the CD. <laughs> and I think that actually encouraged piracy. So I think it's the other way. I think if you create new services, you create real value, and you charge fair prices, you know, people are happy to pay for value. And so I, I think that it's the, gonna be the same issue with digital, we're all going digital. This is just the physical going digital. I mean, copyright law doesn't protect an idea. It protects the expression of an idea. So I, I can make the, the same can at home as long as I you know, create it myself. Uh, if I copy someone else's can, then I might be inf infringing a copyright. So um, you know, I, I think there's well, a lot of room in, in, in this 
3D printing for people to it, it, make, make their own thing and not be infringing someone's copyright. There's definitely room to do it the right way, but I, I will point out that the 3D printer is one of the few tools in the world where you can make something that violates trademark, copyright, and patents in one single object, right? But I mean, well, the Xerox, but, machine, well, the Xerox but, machine, you know, was a yeah, great, but copyright but, infringer too, right? But to but, Eric's you know, point, but that the, didn't stop people from right. marketing Xerox well, machines. Well, but the way you have to think about it is in Hollywood structure, right? And, and if you think about it, you know, so much of the entertainment industry is protected behind copyright and trademark, and I think that's where you're going with it, which is that's where you can turn the Little Mermaid doll from a physical object manufactured in China, shipped over here and sold to Toys R Us, into a SaaS product. So if you think about it, when you look at it, you know, Disney or whoever, I don't know who Little Mermaid is, is owned by, is getting six bucks for a $40 item, right? That's their license royalty component of that product. Now, if the consumer was able to make that at home and Disney or whoever else it is is getting two or three times that because they've shifted all those other costs over to the consumer side of the story, that's a game changer. Now, if you add the recyclability to that issue, think about it. Dis all Disney would love to do is just keep selling you $10 licenses to go print things, right? Does it's like SaaS. We've now turned them into what we've done with software. So that's super interesting in a lot of ways. The question is, is the consortiums of the HPs in the world going to put in similar controls that were put in place, let's say, with the DVD, why you couldn't just copy off DVD? So we'll see how what happens there. Question right here. Yeah. Yes, I actually have two questions. The first question is for Esther. Um, you mentioned about a bunch of um, 340 um, startups doing this. How is your printer different? Why is it better? <laughs> you can get to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just real quick, uh, you can scale with our printer from one printer to hundreds of printers and we have software that will let you do that. That's really important if you're trying to make a million parts. It's not really about the printers anymore, it's about the full service at that point. Um, the other thing is we have more materials than anyone else in the world. So our closest competitor has 30 materials that you can print with. We are at 88 at the moment and by the end of this year we will be at 200. How much does your printer cost? Oh, 4,095. I always have to remember the 95. Got to move it to 97. Yeah. The new 95 the 90, is 97. Go. Okay, 4,097. Yeah. There'll be a tweet about that tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was actually trying to make a consumer product. Um, it's, it has gears, it has engagement, yeah. parts, and it has engagement. I tried 3D printing and I wasn't too happy. Yeah. I went to Stratus 3D Systems mm. um, and uh, some other. And, and you know, it's the size, it's the weight, why is the it's like the helmet? Yeah. Uh, weight and it costs about seven hundred dollars. Yeah. And what I'm not happy about it, I'm seven hundred dollars for prototyping is fine, which is a plastic mm. product in the end. But what I didn't like was the precision, the lack of precision, because the gears don't work together. Yeah. And also the surface is not uh, smooth. Yeah. So I mean, is there somebody out there yeah. who can make something very close to the end possible? There is. So so. Hong, is that your name? Yeah. yeah, so you are not alone. There are very, very, very many people like you that have tried 3D printing and not had it work for them. And this is part of the problem with the hype that's been, where you have just all of these 3D printing manufacturers uh, promising the world and delivering very, very little. And the thing to realize about these 3D printers is that they're still tools that you actually have to optimize your designs for. So we can help you take into account tolerances, uh, you know, different material properties, all of those elements that you actually need to kind of design a little bit for if you're going to use this tool for prototyping or production. Um, the easiest thing to do is just email me and I'd be more than happy to sit down. It may be that you're still going to be better off injection molding your parts when you go into manufacturing. We actually recommend that for a lot of customers still. And it really depends on the geometry of your part and, and the, the cost ratio and how many and so on. So, so it's, you know, 3D printing isn't going to replace injection molding uh, anytime soon, I believe. It is a um, tool that can create new things in new ways. Uh, for certain parts, uh, it may be more cost-effective to go with 3D printing, um, but they're, they're complementary technologies in many ways. And, uh, and you're definitely not alone. There, there are so many people that have run into this where they try it, 
it's, it's hopeful, but then it just doesn't give you the performance that you need. And um, it is actually one of the, the biggest sort of um, gripes I have with the 3D printing industry at the moment is that we haven't taken, as an industry, uh, a responsible role when it comes to communicating expectations and print quality and performance. Uh, there is still no industry print quality grading skill. There's still no industry for what? Uh, there's no quality grading skill. You can't see what the print quality is from one printer to the next with you know a single rating system. Right. There's no rating system across the industry. No. It's a huge problem. Okay, right, so um, I think we've, you all kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but kind of I'm wondering about how you guys feel about like kind of the resistance people have because you know there's a new idea, there's a lot of the copyright and the stealing of ideas and open source and all this kind of stuff. How do you feel people will maybe kind of resist or uh, feel taken aback by uh, kind of the new ideas that come through along with the 3D printer as well as the 3D printer? Wait till someone makes their kid a rhino-shaped watermelon plastic, uh, watermelon candy pop, right, and hands it to them, and it was their magical shape that they wanted. It's going to be moments like that that will really kind of change it. It's, it's just sort of like the first time people had mobile devices and their car broke down, and they were like, oh, I can just make a phone call. And it, it, you know, moments like that are starting to happen in this space, whether it's a huge manufacturer or whether it's an individual or whether it's, you know, someone in a burn center that's getting skin made for them. I mean, those are the moments that will open this door, really. Right. And I just also think, too, it, things don't happen overnight. This is a long uh -huh. transition, you know. And, and I always like to uh, uh, go back to the personal computer. When personal computers first came out, not every secretary in America got laid off, right? It didn't happen, right? It, 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 it's like over time, these things, and, and there are tools that they get adopted, the change happens over time. I, I mean, I, I actually think that's such a good response because like, these guys have more experience with me than me when it comes to like going through a boom and bust cycle. Uh, and one of the things that's really interesting, this is kind of like my first cycle. You know? uh, I moved to San Francisco five years ago, I got married, that's why I'm here. Um, totally random, right? Um, Congratulations. Talking to, Good choice. Yeah, but like, I mean, talking to us and uh, other people. Could have moved here, to Mogadishu. I could have, yeah. Uh, North Korea here is really pleasant this time of year as well. Um, but, but I ended up here, and, and what I'm seeing is like, there's, there seems to be patterns that repeat again and again. What you're talking about, Lucian, is really like early versus mid to late adoption as well. You know, you always get resistance. Um, but there's magic moments. That's it. That's when you can work, right? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Bill? Next. Um, one of the things that uh, enabled Steve Jobs to really like, change the way the user was treated was that he was able to hold on to control the iTunes platform. Um, who is making the 3D printing uh, iTunes or Spotify when it comes to these 3D models and like people who create them also like being able to access like being able to control how how the end user is well, all the studios working on it. FedEx is a huge uh, project underway. I mean, the, you know, the little UPS mailing store next to my office, because the guy is a former tech guy, happens to have a 3D printer. But, you know, we're not at FedEx Kinko's levels yet, and that's where I was mentioning earlier, maybe the HP entrance and other yeah. elements like that will create those industry groups, starting with quality, moving into, just like music, there's a, there's a boatload of industry groups associated with everything from labeling to defining, to copyright control, and there's a giant stack. And I won't say that Steve Jobs is the guy, he just made a prettier box than everybody else and, and believed more than anybody else. But that hasn't really, you know, we're still so early. I mean, you know, as I was saying earlier, and, and I think everybody else, we're still, in, these are prototype things, like what Hong is doing with it, right? You know, I'm not going to go home and crank out a new taillight for my car, right? And we're not quite there yet. Yeah, and, but, you know, we're almost there. We're, yeah. we're so close for certain see, He's the Steve Jobs guy, right? He's right, like, right. yeah, man, you're going to crank out a taillight. I'm like, oh, well, so, so, so I, I'm going to need a kidney first. I, I, don't well, know. You know, I, I am no Steve Jobs. Um, 
and 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 I, I don't think I would want to be a Steve Jobs. More to the point, I, I think we're on the verge. What we're seeing is industries that are making simple plastic parts that would benefit from additive manufacturing technologies are starting to adopt them now, right? And in fact, there are a lot of parts that are 3D printed that people don't even know about. Like one of the largest things is uh, Invisalign. Mm -hmm. You guys know those C3 braces? Those yeah. are all 3D printed molds. The other one is, is if you have a hearing aid, the custom tip is most likely 3D printed 60 million 3D prints since 2006, right? So, so there is within these areas already that sort of level of adoption. And I think you're right, you know, there are these platforms that are going to start emerging, but I don't necessarily think, I don't think there's going to necessarily be an iTunes of 3D printing. And there are a lot of companies that are pitching that, right. but the reason I don't think it is going to be uh, necessarily, uh, I don't think it's going to unfold in that way because when I want to buy a car, I go to the car dealership that, that, that sells, you know, whatever brand it is that I want. And they might have more brands and more choice, but I still want to kind of, you know, go to the, 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 the store and the industry uh, stage. And there really aren't that many, like, places online where you can go and buy anything. And in fact, the only, like, there's like Amazon and Alibaba, right? And, and, and those, there already is an Amazon out there. I think it's going to be hard to compete with another, like, to, to, to beat them at their own game. But it's I think Google Play Store. That's yeah. where there you're going to get your stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. To quickly mention, though, there's the, there is a Thingiverse, which, I mean, it's not an app store, but it is a repository of a lot yeah. of 3D yeah. printed. Sure. And so, I mean, it, I, our name is MakerBot did that because people are buying the printers and like, now what? what yeah, do yeah, do? right. You have to seed your market to start. And But there's a there's an infrastructure, to Espen's point, of all of this already. You're just dealing with another digital file that you're going to, to the digitization of the space, right? So if you were getting a piece of music or a movie or a 3D model or a VR thing, they're all going to come through the same pipe in the same way. So those distribution systems are sort of settled matters at this point. But, but, but I think, you know, the, the, the core takeaway, if, if, if I could give you one, is like people don't care about 3D printing. They care about the part in their hand at the end of the day, like their product, right? And so that's why I don't think most people will ever touch a CAD file or you know, even a 3D printer. That's just background stuff for you to be able to get your, you know, amazing 3D printed insole, right? That's right. custom. But we want to you. fund you that makes the thing, that makes the 3D insole so that you'll get bought and then we'll make money. There That's you our go. plan. Yeah. Yeah. It's our grand plan, our strategy here. Thank you. Yes. So, um, leaving aside the, the organ printing, which will be, you know, sort of huge. Yeah, come on. Give me some. Maybe the bespoke thing and focusing on what you said, which is the additive plastic parts. It's an opportunity for a huge transformation just with no inventory, right? Yeah. No shipping from China, et cetera, et cetera. But this often comes under this umbrella of, oh, and we'll be returning manufacturing to the States. And I, I kind of want to challenge that a bit because what you're going to return to the States is a bank of your machines in a local distribution center. Fully right? automated, yeah. With a couple of minimum wage guys to put in a box and drive them over to the customer who wants them. So you're going to cut out the the overhead, the fuel that... Well, 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 them. well, no, no, no. Now, kind of no, no, you've got operators. Trying to make them to produce a much more efficient thing for the society as a whole, but I don't think it's the return of well, manufacturing. Let me speak to that. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, yep, absolutely going to automate our print pod systems as much as we can. Right? Robots are coming. And they're going to take all of our jobs. And so we're going to have to invent new ones. And it's not technology that takes your job. It's people with an understanding of technology that outcompetes people that don't have that understanding. And so I think that there is, yeah, well, you, know, you, you can argue that, but again and again throughout history, we've been very, very good at you know, coming up with new jobs, like cutting each other's hair, or you know, doing theater, or doing stuff that isn't fundamental to our survival, but brings pleasure and value to our everyday context uh, on a societal level. And so I think that this is a shift, and there's huge opportunity, given that shift, to come up with new jobs, particularly in the service industry. You know, it used to be that it would be cheaper to throw, and it still is, I think, cheaper to throw away your lawnmower when it's not working anymore and go buy a new oh, one. It is. They built it that yeah. way. Yeah. But maybe if you're doing local production, that's no longer going to be the case. Maybe it, there'll, there'll be some service jobs that you can reinvent there. Right? And, and, and in a similar way, 
what I think is really, really cool about this global network of local manufacturing is that you can be anywhere in the world and design something and have access to global markets. But I think that we have a real challenge to educate, you know, particularly our younger population around, you know, programming, 3D printing, modeling, you know, the, the skills that will be the jobs of the future. And, and I think also there are a lot of people that will find themselves out of a job through automation. Um, and we have to be able to, to account for that and take care of that. Uh, and so the, there's a real shift there. Uh, but I'm not going to pretend that everything's going to be OK. And we're going to bring manufacturing back. Well, actually, when we first started um, uh, the, the cluster, we, we, we had this. You know, I had Jackie Spears and Stanley Hoyer um, at our facility. And I was up there. I'd just been in the country less than a year. You know, banging on the podium with the American Eagle Congressional Seal, you know, saying we're bringing jobs to America, and it was true at the time we were bringing jobs to America, uh, but I don't think it's going to necessarily be in the way that I had first imagined. I think it's going to have to be a little bit more creative than that. And actually, I think we're going to see more and more startups come out of this than ever before, and I think it's going to be amazing. But it's not going to be the same type of manufacturing jobs that we've thought about in the past. And just on that, you know, it, it, I think it also goes beyond just the jobs. Everyone's like, where's the jobs, where's the jobs? But I think there's another component here. Of if you become, just like energy independent, production independent, right? So as a country, if we're producing the products we consume, you know, this is changing the economics. So yes, maybe this is a, a jobless recovery, but at the same time, we're not creating a trade imbalance. We're not creating the, the, the monies that are made and spent are not necessarily, we're not sending raw materials all over the world and shipping well, products. I mean, the, you know, a lot of people were out of business when the, when the car took over the buggy or when the train took over this yeah. or when, you know, the machine took over the hand carver. I mean, this is an inherent evolution of the model. And I think if you look to China, they're getting out in front of this. Unfortunately, in the U.S., we've historically been a little bit lazy about these things outside of Silicon Valley. And, you know, Ed, you know, however you want to look at it and don't take this in any political way, but if you were cranking away at $60 an hour at a union job in Detroit and you've had your whole life and you checked the box and you left at the end of the day and that was your world, right, you didn't maybe have the foresight to be able to turn around and say, ooh, I better start going into computers because a robot's going to replace me, but the guy who's going who's gonna to maintain that robot's not. And so that's where when you see a country like China spending all this money, spending all this time trying to get into robotics, get into 3D printing, it's because they need to change it from their people putting the little you know, pieces together to driving the robot or driving that. And they're, they're trying as an, as an organized culture to get out in front of it, an organized government to get out in front of it. We talked a little bit about the hardware companies, the new applications that are coming. You mentioned open source is sort of the, the guts of the machines and that Autodesk has the CAD side of it. What opportunities are there for a new software startup? Is the software actually trailing the hardware in some way, somewhere in between the open source guts things and the Auto, AutoCAD? Is there space there? I was going to say, you hear more pitches than I Yeah, do, so, I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, there's a lot of elements in the supply chain element. Uh, you know, probably what makes Type A so unique is, it, is it's a solution. They, they are a software and hardware where the, the whole maker component was, all right, you got a box. All right, what are you going to do with your box, right? right. But if your box don't play, don't essentially well, play well, to well be, together. To be clear, you get a box of parts, and then you have to build okay. the box. Yeah. Well, so let's yeah. say we bought one. Let's say we got the fully assembled, yeah. you know, version. Yeah. You know, that, that was it. So you've got a whole supply chain. It's just like if you were to say, well, geez, server farms are going to eliminate everything else. Well, if you think about it, here we are 20 years into server farms, and they're a huge amount of business. I just saw a new server deal the other day where it was a less energy, higher density, more machines. I mean, there's a huge business around that um, there as well. And just to give you an idea, I mean, Robotics this is the funniest story I've heard in a while. So robots are going to put us all out of business, right? But you know the interesting thing is robots need grease 
in order for their joints to move. And a guy that I know whose family's been in the prototype business in the Valley for years started selling these little bits of grease, you know, which are actually made in very boutique sort of Japanese high quality operations. They're like $7 a drop, right? So they realized that no one's selling this stuff. So he's built a multi-million dollar business in under three years, basically buying 55-gallon drums from Chai, uh, from Japan, packaging them into little bottles because that's all the robots really need, and then selling them for like 100 bucks a shot all around the U.S. I mean, and, and so you think about it, there's a huge amount of opportunities, right? So if I, you know, uh, uh, there are two kinds of, you know, I invest with the basis that I need to get 10x return, right? But you don't. I mean, as entrepreneurs, you want to just make money. I mean, a 3x return is going to make you a really, really wealthy person, right? So if you think about it, you probably should go to China and start a grease business because at the end of the day, they're going to be a lot of robots and they're all going to need grease. Or start, you know, a software company to determine when they're going to need grease. I mean, on, on the three, uh, that's that's an awesome story. Thank you. Uh, I, and I think, you know, on, on the 3D printing side, five minutes, uh, on the 3D printing side, the, the software that there are lots of opportunities in software, and I have a couple in the back of my mind. So if, if you want to start something, come talk to me, and I'll, I'll totally uh, speak to that. Um, but in general, you know, platform plays are really, really powerful. There's, there's a gold rush right now, right? So like just in the automotive industry, replacement car parts for plastic parts for oh. all the cars, yeah. impossible to get hold of. There is no online object library of plastic parts. It just doesn't exist. And so anyone who goes point. in like takes that, that's going to be a multi-million dollar business, you know, as soon as you can can see right. it with, with with parts and then connect it to to, to local um, uh, dealerships. And like they're they're just I, I've got a whole list of those kind of businesses, and just not enough time in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actively looking for more people to bring into our cluster to kind of develop those things because. They have I think to have everybody them. just got a job, so just kind of see Espen yeah, after. Yeah, there you go. So He's going to be handing out right. startups for you. You just pick one and get rolling. <laughs> yeah. And then call us. Yes. That's how it works. Yes. In a box. That's right. Call Steve. Yeah. Come to Espen. Uh -huh. Go to Steve. Paper the deal. Yeah. Go, go show at Eric's conference. And then when you get some traction, come to us and we'll find you. Yep. Yeah. There you go. That's, That's it. So we, just, we solved it all for you. Turnkey <laughs> operation. Robert up here had a question. He had a question. Did you Will still you have a question? This a startup as a service? Yeah. Uh, people are trying so to do it. We don't that. buy that. That's like, yeah, startup as a service now. All right, I have a question. Apparently, it has to be really good, so I'll try my best. Don't um, screw so it up, man. <laughs> don't screw it up, CJ. I will not. <laughs> so it's been said, obviously, it's a very fast growing space. Um, from a saleability standpoint, so making money off of this hype, what's the fastest growing customer segment over the next two to three years? And most importantly, how will we engage them? You mentioned the education standpoint, a lot of hype two years ago. It's been showing off a little bit from the general public. That's why there are only like 40 people here. Two years ago, this room would have been packed. Exactly. So we're not, we're down in the hype cycle. So my two questions is what's the customer segment that's fastest growing over the next two to three years? and how will we engage them to buy the product? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, industry is definitely, you know, as a very big category. Uh, what we, I can tell you what we're targeting right now, which is effectively spaces with still fairly high margin, low volume production quantities of, of, of core plastic parts. I think that's the low hanging fruit. So for us, it's aerospace what we call body fit, so anything that fits onto your body, be it the bike helmet or you know, custom ski boots. Um, and then education is actually uh, still a really, really interesting space. We, we have a significant uh, portion of, of our customers come from education. It's not single printers, it's pod systems for high schools and universities. Their engineering departments need to be able to do massively parallel production of unique parts because that's what their students are doing for all of their thesis projects. And so, you know, and, and bringing it back to bringing jobs to America and stuff, you know, getting a 3D printing system into every school in the US should be a top priority because that's what's gonna give people the tools to create the startups and the jobs of the future. 
I'm going healthcare because there's so yeah. many things in B, that. So healthcare has been using it, and we're, you know, Espen was talking about tips of this. But if you think about it, there are so many things. Whether it's a brace for your hand, or you sprain your leg, or the size of your crutches, or a bandage, or any of these other elements that are very important to be customized. And you know, that is you know also a high value yep. business. You know, if you're paying two hundred dollars for that cast or for that you know brace and it the difference between it rubbing on your leg and hurting you and causing more damage or one that's absolutely perfect for you and actually allows you to heal better that's a game changer and that's still the same thing yeah. just with it with a 3d scanner and a, a modeling system that so there's all kinds of software that needs to get built to make that happen yeah. And I, I love your idea of the replacement parts. I think that's a, a key area. I mean, I heard that one of the best use cases I heard early on about 3D printers were actually the BART trains because they were not being manufactured. Yeah. They needed 3D printed metal parts. It was cheaper to 3D print. So I think replacement parts are a big Hot problem. rods, man. Hot, uh, the future but, of 3D plastic is hot rods. So, uh, yeah, it, absolutely. And, and, and no, I'm not kidding. A different way of thinking about it is, is in terms of application, right? So what is it that 3D printing does well? Well, it does really three things really well. So one is you can print closer to the end user than if you have a central manufacturing facility. So if time is of the essence, you know, say you're on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic and you need a spare part, well, maritime industry just got a really big market right there. If you, so, so that's one, one application. The other one is if you need something custom, whether it's in the medical industry or you know, custom insoles or whatever, needs to fit to my body or, or to the particular application, okay, well, you've got a huge number of markets just growing up through, through there. And then the final thing, uh, which I think is kind of interesting, particularly for aerospace and for automotive, is the weight reduction and the internal geometry of parts. The fact that we can control you know, that and reduce weight is, is something that you really can't do with any other tool. Well, so since all these parts are made of uh, plastic, or a lot of them are, I think we've kind of come back to the graduate, where what's, what are you going to do when you grow up? Plastics, my boy. Uh -huh. Plastics. Yeah, there you go. So, yep. Anyway. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for, to the audience. Thanks to the panel. Thank you.